Hello and welcome to Talk God. It's as much about you as it is about us here in the studio. If God is for you, no one can be against you. Today you can be free. You can have your sins forgiven. Welcome. This is Thursday the 19th of February and this is Simply the Truth live with me, Doug Harris. Thank you for joining us. And today uh, what we are going to do is to share the truth as simply as possible on a subject that we certainly get asked an awful lot about and that's the whole area of spiritual warfare and deliverance. And so uh, whether we're actually going to finish the program today or whether it's going to be part one, We'll see as we uh, as we go through, but there there is uh, such a need to have an understanding of these issues, not to overcomplicate it, but to be aware of what Scripture says, to be aware of what our authority is in uh, Jesus Christ. And I guess uh, I I think there's going to be a fair amount of agreement between the three of us today. There might be a slightly different view on some of the spectrum of things, but. We really uh, want to deal with this issue today because more and more people are facing these issues. But is the church making more of it than there is? Are we making more of Satan uh, than he really is? And so these are some of the areas we want to look at and want to uh, uh, deal with uh, today. So what I was hoping to do today, John, for all the viewers was take away some of the fears uh, and Doug and take away some of the apprehensions people have about deliverance mm. um, show them through scripture that it is a God given right for us to enter into spiritual warfare and overcome the works of the devil as Jesus did when he walked the earth Good. I, I think we have plenty of opportunity to do that as, as, as we go through um, maybe uh, for both of you and we'll still start with you uh, Michael but what what experience you, you say God called you yes into that yes, ministry. Yes. What experience, uh, just in broad strokes, have you had, just so that uh, we can help the viewers understand that we're not just dealing with head knowledge here. Okay. What experience have you had of deliverance and spiritual warfare over the years? Well, we currently we currently hold a, a Sunday afternoon meeting in Friends House, which is the Quaker building in the Euston Road. And we've met there now for three years. And prior to that, we held other regular meetings in different parts of London. And people come on a weekly basis and they come there, people with problems, and we try and help them via the Word of God. Everything we do must be backed up by the Word of God. Good. Otherwise, it's, as you say, it's head knowledge and it's our own opinions. And in the Kingdom of God, our own opinions don't mean an awful lot. <laughs> a lot so we should sort of stay away from them. Uh, been in ministry now for 12 years. Uh, did work for a, a famous American evangelist who's at that time's areas was in healing and deliverance. And, you know, uh, have studied as much as I can based on the old evangelists from the 30s and 40s, people like Jack Coe and Oral Roberts and, you know, and looked at what their experience was, people like Smith Wigglesworth, and really al aligned the Word of God to people's needs in the area of healing and deliverance. Good, 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 good. some good uh, um, credentials uh, there. JT, um, I know we've talked about a lot of subjects over yeah. the, the, the months that you come up. Um, to us. Um, I don't think we've ever really touched upon this area uh, specifically. I, I think we've, we've just skirted, skirted it, it haven't we? Yeah. So share a little bit with us how you came into understanding okay. of deliver and what experience you've had of the subject. Mm. Yeah. Some viewers may know that I, I was brought up as a Christian, oh I wasn't brought up as a Christian, but when I became a Christian at the age of 12 my input if you like was cessationist. It was a brethren church strong on Bible, not strong on Holy Spirit. So I had zero knowledge of anything of this nature until I was in my 20s. And what sparked my involvement in this area off was a study that I did on the Kingdom of God. And uh, I, I looked at every reference to the Kingdom in the New Testament, I read Matthew a lot of times, and you just can't escape the fact that if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, the Kingdom of God has come upon you, which is what Jesus said. So. Uh, I concluded from my study, Now I, I was in a, a leadership type position in the church then, I concluded from my study that if we are to proclaim the good news of the Kingdom of God, then we're going to see people delivered from demonic power. 
The first um, practical experience I had was way back in 1985. I was doing a foundation course in the church and we were, we were doing the Holy Spirit that night and we had what uh, I'm sure we'll talk about, a manifestation. And the girl was screaming the place down. So um, that was the first one I, I dealt with. And it was a few years later when I became much more active in this area. So um, whether it's in Zambia or whether in the UK, what I've sought to do is um, uh, work out what I understand Scripture says should happen. I was involved uh, in quite a number of deliverance situations. And um, what, I, what I feel I've done is being able... I read a lot of books. I read a lot of books by deliverance people. Um, and I was very unhappy with a lot of them because they were so experiential. They, they, based, they sometimes developed their teaching and their doctrine based on what they had experienced and seen. And what I have done, I believe, is develop a methodology and a way of dealing with the demonic which, d which doesn't rely so strongly on the experiential things that you see and observe, mm -hmm. um, but allows, that, uh, allows you to have a flexible approach without being dogmatic. Mm. Okay, so again, both of you have hands-on experience, and which, uh, as you say, and it's not just uh, uh, looking at things uh, from the theoretical point of view, it's is, is the working through. What well, if we could begin, um, uh, Michael, maybe with you, uh, uh, the question that I know is asked me again and again, and something which a lot of people have a real problem with, and, 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 and that is this whole area of ancestral curses, of generational yes, curses. Is it, first of all, and I sort of ask this question and we develop it out from there, is it inevitable that every Christian has this problem of ancestral or generational curse? In other words, if somebody in their ancestors is a, you know, a witch or whatever, are they automatically going to have problems? That's what some people say. What would you say on that? Well, based on the things I've seen over the years, uh, I do realise that certain people who have occult backgrounds have had ma various covenants and vows, sometimes blood covenants, that have been sworn over them in the past. And sometimes these covenants have not only been sworn over the participator, but they've been sworn on future generations. So for argument's sake, they've been sworn on their children and their children's children. Mm -hmm. I have found, I, I'll give you an example Please once. A lady came to me many, many years ago, and I felt that there was something in the bloodline that wasn't quite right. And I asked her what her grandmother was. Now, bearing in mind, when Satan bears down on someone, he makes you feel guilty and shameful about your past and your ancestors' past. The lady told me that her grandmother was a Sunday school teacher in the church. I always would seek the Holy Spirit and seek discernment over anything anyone tells me. We don't take anything at face value. Right. Always go and pray over it. Seek the Holy Ghost. Uh, I went back and I, and I kept on weeks going. And she manifested very badly. She used to vomit. She used to reach. She used to fall on the floor, roll about. She used to swear at me, call me all sorts of names. Finally, after three weeks, she admitted that her grandmother was a witch mm -hmm. when pressed. And I said, why didn't you say before? She said, because I felt so much shame. So one of the problems that I found with people, I never met my grandparents. I only knew one of them who was very old when I was very little. I've got no idea what they was into. Right. I haven't got a clue. So I say we should look at that area, not necessarily condemn people and say, well, your granddad was this. If your granddad was a Freemason, we know that there's certain vows that are sworn in Freemasonry, but we shouldn't accept that, that when people have a conversion experience, if they've brought everything to the Lord that they know about, then we accept that God has set them free by his word and by mm -hmm. his promises. Mm -hmm. But I think we have to look at the ancestral. The scripture says in Deuteronomy, it speaks about ancestral curses, Deuteronomy 5 verses 9 and 10, but Ezekiel 18 also says the soul that sins that dies. Yes. So it tends to remove it away from the generational bloodline and bring it the property and the responsibility of the person. Mm -hmm. So I would say we have to look at all things, never discount anything, look at the generational bloodline. I don't necessarily think that everyone picks up generational curses. Mm -hmm. There's lots of Christians out there that have lived in Christian families for generations where the Word of God has been held in the highest esteem. Yeah. So if they do have problems, uh, you know, we shouldn't just jump to that conclusion.